Good afternoon. Welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Ashley Wilcott here with you today, along with my in-studio guest, Julie Rendelman. We have a lot to cover, a lot of exciting news, so let's jump right into it. The first thing we're going to do is return live to Tennessee versus Eric Boyd. And this is the case in which he's accused of murdering two very young victims. One was 23, the other, Shannon, was only 21. And we're going to re return directly into live trial at this time. All right, well, I'm glad to be back here at Law and Crime. Now I know where to look and tell you what we're doing right now. They are going to be taking a lunch break in this case. When they return from lunch, we anticipate continuing live trial in that case. In the meantime, we want to play for you the opening statements where the prosecution gives us a good idea of what they expect the evidence is going to show. Again, we're look. Again, we're listening to part of the prosecution's opening statements. And when we listen to that, part of what I want you to keep in mind, as we pointed out when we were running across the bottom of the screen, these murders occurred some time ago. We are looking at crimes that were committed in 2007, so 12 years ago. Two victims, Shannon is the 21-year-old, along with Christopher Newsom, 23-year-old. So Julie Rendelman, defense attorney, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Always happy to see you. So tell us about, first of all, the prosecution, your defense attorney. What would you be noting, if anything, about the prosecutor's demeanor, how she was delivering her opening statement, and does that impact a jury? So let's begin by saying, and, and I hate being the person who's going to criticize the prosecutor, criticize the defense, but we are here on long crime, and so we analyze everything. We can't help ourselves. And so as a prosecutor, because I was a former prosecutor, you want to get out there and start talking to this jury and get them enraptured immediately. This is the most heinous, brutal murder that many of us have seen in years, and you want to get that jury's attention. So as a defense attorney, if I'm sitting there, I'm pleased with what's happening because she is not enrapturing that jury. She is literally bringing them step by step through this case, which to me is not necessarily what the opening's about. So, I, I mean, perhaps we didn't see the whole thing, but it, to me, um, she's missing the mark when it comes to a solid opening statement. So let me ask, when you're trying to compel the jury to believe, okay, I'm going to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, but you've got a crime that's 12 years old, you have heinous crime, but 12 years old. How, if you were the prosecutor in this case, how would you organize your opening statement? Would you do it chronologically or would you, how would you approach that? Well, one of the concerns you always have as a prosecutor is that you don't want to say every word that your witness is going to say because they're never going to say exactly what you said in opening. And then the jury's going to sit there and say, well, wait a second, if it's different from what she, t she stated in opening, does that mean they're not credible? So you have to be very wary of how much you tell the jury. You want to kind of give the jury an understanding of the brutality of this crime and give snippets and pieces as to why it is that Eric Boyd is the person that is responsible acting in concert with the others. And you want to focus on Eric Boyd and what he did to, uh, to involve himself in this crime. All right, so let's do this. We're going to go back and show you more of the opening statement by the prosecutor to see if, in fact, she brings it home to say this is what he did in this case. Well, again, that's the opening statement by the prosecutor, and Julie, really a horrific case. Let's break it down in terms of what the state alleges factually happened in this case. So we know that these two young individuals, 26, excuse me, 23-year-old Christian, 21-year-old Shannon, were headed out on a date to go to a friend's birthday party, where they were then kidnapped, taken to a house on, I believe, Chipman Street, and they were then uh, brutally beaten raped and allegedly the state's position and an understanding of that I have in this case is that they were then the the male Christian was killed executed quickly and his body was burned but then the female Shannon was kept captive and again brutally beaten raped how much sympathy is the jury going to have for these two victims and therefore try to hold the defendant accountable for that, in your opinion? Uh, I don't think you can get much more sympathy. And, and honestly, the brutality of this is, is I, I, I would like to think it's uh, you know, unheard of. We've heard it before. Um, but you know, this is a jury that's sitting here for the first time listening to this case that, even though it happened in 2007, still, when you hear what happened to these young kids, you, you, you are any 
of us are sickened um, and only feel for the family. So I think that that is one of the things the prosecution has over this guy. Um, and that the issue is going to be, um, and especially for the defense, is there's not DNA evidence that ties, unless I don't know about it, but there's not, as far as I know, there's no uh, forensic evidence that links Eric Boyd to this case. And a lot of this evidence is going to rely on one of the defendants that's already been convicted and is serving a life sentence. And that, to me, is going to be the problem <laughs> for the prosecutors, how to deal with that specific witness. And not only that, but also, you know, his defense is he's denying he was there. He is saying he wasn't even at that house where all of this happened. Good defense or not? Well, remember, he was already convicted of helping the ringleader hide out. And so that happened, I think, way back in two, that between 2007 and 2011. I know he, there was an appellate. That's right. 2008. Yes. Um, so he was convicted in federal court. He was never charged with the murder. And it, the, the question is, was he charged with the murder because now they have this cooperator, or did they think they always had evidence? They always thought maybe he was involved, but there was never evidence tying him there. And so the question really is, what's the new evidence that, that not is going to that doesn't just establish that he helped someone get away, but that he was actually a participant? in the murders of these two young people. That's right. I think that's going to be the obstacle in this case. Let's talk about, so he was convicted of the two federal charges. This was in 2008. I understand that was appealed. I believe that appeal was lost. But what I want you to know is the, the crimes he was convicted of in the federal case are accessory after fact of carjacking resulting in serious bodily harm and death. Now, the carjacking is important to me because we're talking about the motive. And I believe in this case, the only motive that is a possible motive that the states come up with is the carjacking. But is that enough motive that he completed, that he committed these two heinous crimes? We're going to talk about that a little bit more on the other side of this break. So please come back and join us here with my guest, Julie, right after this short break. This is the beginning of the defense opening statement. And I want to point out a couple of things that I noted when he made his opening statement. And that is, First of all, he does say, listen, there were three co-defendants. They've been convicted, keep that in mind, of many charges, including first-degree murder for the murders of these two individuals. And he goes on to say that at that time, his client was not charged with anything. What's the significance of that to you, Julie? He, he, uh, first of all, we compare the two of them. He's doing such a fantastic job of getting this jury to focus. The first thing he's saying is, this is kind of one of those cases where you're going to hate everybody, but you can't let your hatred affect your decision in my client's case. Second, that the that the prosecutor spent millions of dollars, and what I believe what he's trying to say is, although he hasn't clarified that yet, they spent millions of dollars trying to figure out forensically who and how to link people to this crime. And at the end of the day, all the forensic linked to everyone else other than his client. And the third thing he did, which was fantastic, was he is now talking about George Thomas. George Thomas is the main witness. And what he's telling the story is way back when, when George Thomas was trying to get himself out of it, he lied. And so he wants them to know he's going to come back into this courtroom and do the exact same thing he did in 2007. Perfect. All right, so now tell me this. What do you think is going to happen in terms of how the prosecution is going to utilize this George Thomas to convince the jury that, no, he is telling the truth, and this fourth defendant now on this crime was involved? Ex excellent question. I think what they're going to need to do is corroborate what George Thomas has to say. So if George Thomas says he was at a specific location, can they corroborate it with other evidence? It may not be eyewitnesses, but there might be phone records, something that supports what George Thomas has to say. And they're going to have to make sure George Thomas is forthright about every single thing he's ever done and said from beginning to time to now, because that defense attorney is going to pounce on him because he is the most to gain to not tell that jury the truth. And that's what I think. George Thomas is going to be an interesting witness to watch because they are really going to have to prove that he's truthful. And I will just remind you, he's been convicted of many counts and he is incarcerated at this point in time. We'll see whether or not he comes across as truthful. This defense attorney has done an excellent job, in my opinion, and here's why. Because he has already said he's laid the foundation. This is a horrible crime. You do have a case in which two young individuals were kidnapped, raped, tortured, killed. 
horrible circumstances. But he reminds them at the end of his opening statement, but you have to remember the state has the burden. Hold the state to that burden, burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt in this case. So Julie, tell me first of all, overall, what did you think of this defense opening? Fantastic, it, it just hit it right, right on the head, hit every point that a defense attorney should hit, especially in a case with this much publicity and anger surrounding it. So the jury's going to be, you know, immediately focused on trying to convict. He's trying to get them to understand they must prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt, regardless of that. And he did spend a long time talking about George Thomas. And as we were discussing on our break, two consecutive life sentences plus 25 years is what George Thomas was sentenced to for these two murders and other charges that he was convicted of. However, he will be testifying for a reduced sentence of 50 years. Why then wouldn't he lie if he's going to get that kind of reduced sentence? Isn't there an argument that, of course, he's going to say whatever the prosecution wants him to say? Well, obviously, and that's the, and and now you're taking over the defense arguments. And quite frankly, at the end of the day, the prosecution does have an uphill battle. Don't forget that the prosecution does have things on their side, and what they have is they have confessions from this defendant admitting to at least helping uh, the ringleader of this at least after the fact. And so the jury may buy into the notion that if he helped him afterwards, then he must have been trying to cover something up during that time. And maybe that will be filled in by George Thomas to explain some of his, some of his actions during that time. All right, this is gonna be really exciting trial to cover in terms of the evidence that we expect to be presented in the state's case that they're gonna have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. We're gonna take a short break on Law and Crime. We'll be right back.